So we'll continue talking about uh, probability and probability distributions today. So yesterday, we looked at a probability distribution that looked like this. Where here C is any positive constant. And this is a probability distribution. Um, it's always positive, this function is, um, because e to the x, the exponential is always positive. So a positive constant times something that's always positive, Let me see. It's continuous. Um, you can actually be discontinuous at finitely many points, but we'll just think of them as being continuous, and this certainly is. Three. The integral from zero to infinity of C E <clears throat> to the C X DX is the limit as N goes to infinity from zero to N of C E to the C X DX. What number do we have to get for our answer if this is going to be a probability distribution? What does the integral have to be? Wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. There we are. I was looking at that and thinking this can't be right, and it wasn't, but now it is. Well, to answer that, I guess, only semi-rhetorical question, the integral has to be one to represent the idea that something happens with probability one. And ah, because we put this negative sign here, that gives us a negative sign there when we take the antiderivative. Here we go. As n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. E to the zero is one. So this integral is one, their area under the curve is one, the probability that something happens when you run an experiment is one. And let's use this probability distribution to introduce just a few major of the more major concepts of probability. So I'll remind us, though, because I never wrote it on the whiteboard. I just said aloud what this probability distribution is for. So this probability distribution is fit for when you're waiting. for something to happen. And so the experiment you're running 
gives you a variable x, which is the length of time it takes for the event to occur. And the main assumption of this probability distribution is that it's a memory less memory list by which we mean that um the probability of the event happening does not change as time passes. And the classic example that people give, which anyone who goes fishing knows is kind of false, but the classic example people give is fishing. And I mean, the reason I say it's false is that actually when you're fishing, as the sun goes up and the sun goes down, that affects the fish. But we think of the fish as memoryless in the sense that, you know, the fish don't care that you've been fishing for an hour. They either bite or they don't. Um, another kind of classic example is not that we recommend this, but picking up hitchhikers. You know, if you're trying to hitchhike, then the truck driver doesn't know whether you've been there for an hour or 10 hours. They either pick you up or they don't. And at first blush, you might assume that a memoryless probability distribution would look like this. The probability of the event occurring between the first and the second hour is the same as the probability of the event occurring between the fourth and the fifth hour, but that's not quite right because we're waiting for something to happen. Once that something has happened once, we're done. So the fish doesn't care that we've been fishing for four hours, but in order to catch our first fish, between the fourth and the fifth hour, we have to have not caught our first fish earlier. Because of that, this probability distribution actually looks something like that, with the value of C controlling the details of what it looks like. And let's now present a few, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, numerical statistics that get used all of the time in, um, in probability. We presumably have under our belt already 
the idea of an average. If we have a bunch of observations, say we have n observations, we can add them up. and we can divide by n, and that is the average of those expectations. The average is also called the mean. The expected value is a slightly deceptive name because we don't expect any particular value when we run an experiment. Um, the probability of any given value is always zero. But the expected value is like, if you run this experiment, a million trillion times, and you average all of the outcomes, what do you think that average will be? It can be, if you really want to nail this down as a formal definition of calculus, we can think of it as a limit as n goes to infinity. And this, it's actually a pretty deep result um, that this expected value should exist. Because I mean, in the real world, if you run this experiment, you're getting random values for x1. You're getting random values for x2. You're getting random values for x3. But as the number of times we run the experiment goes to infinity, all the randomness smooths itself out, and we just get some number. And the expected value tends to get written as kind of a fancy U. So that's what the expected value is conceptually, but of course we cannot run an experiment infinitely many times and add our results together. What is this as a formula? So if we've got our probability distribution, the expected value is the integral of x times the probability distribution. Let's find an expected value. And because this is one of the nicer probability distributions in terms of um in terms of being able to work with it by hand. Let's find the expected value of C e to the negative C x. Let's find sort of the average value of this experiment. So our integral is going from zero to infinity. We've got x times c e to the negative c x dx. And now we've got some work ahead of us, although not not an impossible amount of work. Put 
been aside the zero and the infinity for a bit. What tool do we need to use to take this integral? Is it integration by parts? It is integration by parts. That's exactly correct. So, because it's a product, and one of these terms is going to be easy to integrate and the other term gets nicer when you take its derivative. And that's sort of what you need to do integration by par. So Lyot says, we'll let you be X. We don't have we don't have logarithms or inverse trig functions. So algebraic functions are first on our list. D of E then is negative E to the negative CX DX. D U is one DX. V is the integral of e to the negative cx dx, which is negative 1 over c e to the negative cx. And then, well, we don't need to bother writing our constant of integration. And I mean, if if you don't see that, we're doing we're doing a quick u substitution. We're letting u be negative c x. D u is negative c d x. We don't have a negative C, so we put one in. And that is where that negative one over C comes from in the answer. So U of E, minus the integral of V du, negative one over C times X times E to the negative CX minus the integral of V du, so du is one, v is negative one over c times e to the negative cx. Okay, so we repeat the the process, we take the integral again. Let me, before we take the integral again, let me take that negative term outside of it. So taking the negative term outside, combined with the fact that we already had a negative there, is going to give us addition. This integral is what? That's correct, thank you. So we wind up with a pretty formidable integral. This negative one over C and this positive one over C. 
Give us a negative one over C squared. E to the negative CX and like Avlov's dog, I the bell rang and I started to write the DX, but there is no DX. This is the integral. Um minus the constant of integration because we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And oof. Yeah, what can I say but oof. So we're integrating this um, from zero to infinity. So it's going to wind up being the integral of the antiderivative. Um, we had this C. So negative one over C X E to the negative C X. minus one over C squared e to the negative CX. Equals, and now, and now this is mainly, I think, let's try not to screw up the algebra that C distributes through negative x e to the negative cx minus one over c e to the negative cx evaluated from zero to n. Ugh, the saving grace of all of this is that um is that at least when we plug in zero, we're just going to get nice stuff. So, um, this is the limit as n goes to infinity of, and now negative n e to the negative c n minus one over c, e to the negative cn minus negative zero e to the negative c times zero minus one over c e to the negative c times zero. And I sort of feel like maybe I lied when I said this was straightforward, but on the other hand, I mean, the only sort of thing I describe as complicated calculus that, that we've done is when we used integration by parts. Other than that, it's just... You know, we're getting these very long terms. Um, so as n goes to infinity, this whole thing goes to zero. And that's probably not obvious. So let's look at it. So as n is going to infinity, we've got two terms here. We've got negative n e to the negative cn. And the way that I know 
this is going to zero, is that I can rewrite this. as a fraction, n over, and then I started to write a negative sign and fixed it. This is the limit as n goes to infinity of n over e to the positive cn. Well, as n goes to infinity, the top and bottom are both going to infinity. So hitting this with L'Hopital's rule, it becomes one over C E to the C N. And then I shouldn't have started writing a new limit because e to the cn goes to infinity. And I mean, this is a slightly informal way of writing, but one over infinity is zero. So taking this piece by piece, this first term is going to zero. And then that second term, We did the tricky one first. We don't need L'Hopital's rule here. The exponential goes to infinity and one over infinity is zero. So those both go to zero. Over here, this is zero. Zero times anything is zero. This is negative one over C. E to the zero is one. So only the negative one over C remains. Then this negative sign and this negative sign and we get positive one over C. So this, um, If we, let's say, if we're fishing and let's say we're at the fishing lodge and we ask all of the other people at the lodge, how long did it take you to catch your first fish? and we decide the expected value is about two. On average, it took people two hours to catch the first fish. Then the expected value, did I, no, I didn't, I didn't erase it, it's right here. The expected value is one over C. So we can solve, we can say that C is one half and the probability distribution at this fishing lodge is one half E to the negative one half X. And this expected value is um 
is kind of, it's the average, basically. I mean, even when I was talking about this example out loud, how would you estimate the expected value? Well, you just get all of the values. You'd ask everyone at the fishing lodge how long it took, and then you'd average those together, and you'd say, okay, the expected value ought to be about that average. There is also the idea of a median. You've got an interval from A to B. The median is a value C sitting in this interval such that the integral from A to C of the probability distribution is one half and the integral from C to B of the probability distribution is one half. So writing this, I mean, if I were Explaining this to someone with no background in mathematics, I'd say it's equally likely that an experiment gives a, an outcome that's less than C or an outcome that's greater than C. Um, unfortunately, there's no really nice formula for finding the median. I mean, I don't know if you want to call, you know, this a really nice formula or not, but at least it is a formula. Um, to find the median, and again, let's do an example. Let's look at this. This, he says. Let's look at this. Probability distribution. And let's try to find the median. And before we try to find the median, before we do the math, um, what the median is for, it's another measure of centrality, a very fancy sounding phrase. I mean, it's doing much the same job that the expected value is doing, but the median, is resistant to outliers. So on Canvas, I give a test and I enter the grades that the students get and um, Canvas gives me a running tally of what the average score is. So I'm entering test grades and I'm getting a 90, an 85, a 75, a 100, 
And you know, Canvas is, is averaging these things as we go. And then I get to a student who skipped the test and I enter in a zero and the average, the mean summits. This zero is called an outlier because it's nowhere near the other values. And including outliers tends to very badly mess with means and make them kind of hard to use. Like, let's go to, let's go to Wolfram Alpha, let's say. Ninety, eighty-five, seventy-five, a hundred, zero. I hope. I mean, sort of the point of Wolfram Alpha is that. Eighty-five, seventy-five, a hundred, zero. I was saying kind of the point of Wolfram Alpha is that it doesn't have like one specific syntax. So I hope it will interpret this correctly. Okay, so it's giving me a mean of seven. Which, you know, I guess isn't that bad. But if instead of like a hundred, I had 85, 85, zero. Now it's giving me a mean of 67. And if I say, well, my students got a D average on this test, it's really giving you an incorrect idea of what's happening, which is that four of my students did fine, and then one student got a very bad F. The median is supposed to be resistant to this kind of thing. Wow, Wolfram Alpha does not like being asked the median. This is not advanced math we're asking it to do. I have no idea what the problem was. But we ask it for a median and we get an 85 here. So half of our students got better than 85 half of our students got worse. Um, I mean, it's a little complicated because there are an odd number of values and the median shows up in the list, but you see that adding this zero does not cause the median to crash the way it causes the mean to crash. So that's what the median is for. As for finding it, well, we want a value up here. We're already using D for something, so let's use M for median. Such that this equals one half. So to find the median, we're going to take this definite integral and we're going to set it equal to one half. Um, negative e to the negative cx 
evaluated from zero to M is negative E to the negative C times M plus one. Is that right? Let me, let me write it out. Minus negative E to the negative C time is a zero. So E to the zero is one. That is indeed correct. This is the integral. And we want it to equal one half. And now we have an algebra problem, although I think our algebra students might give me kind of a nasty look if I, if I dumped it on them. We can subtract one from both sides. We can divide both sides by negative one. We can take the natural logarithm of both sides. And we can solve and we can find the median. Um, in textbooks, this median tends to be written a little differently. Like if you open up a probability and statistics textbook, it's normally written like this. And that is because the natural log of a quotient can be written as subtraction. The natural log of one is zero. And then this negative sign and this negative sign cancel. So you get the positive ln of two. And again, there is no re, even though they're both measuring centrality, the median and the mean can be different numbers. They were with our test example. And here, the median is ln2 over c. The mean is, well, two here. The mean is one over C. So keeping with our fishing example, let's see. One point four. So this tells you that half of the people in the fishing lodge caught their fish um within one point four hours. And half of the people in the fishing lodge caught a fish after 
four hours, and it's different from the average of two. And that's representing, what's it representing? It's representing the idea that some people just sat out there hitting the water for five hours or six hours without catching a fish. Okay, so there's a bunch more we could say about this. I mean, in point of fact, there's an entire class we could say about this. Um, Mr. Seydoun's probability and statistics class. But I think this is a very natural place to call this. I hope that you all have a, a wonderful 